Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the session on uh, generative AI and ML uh, that is being used or can be used in clinical data management. I'm uh, Dr. Santosh. I also have with me Mark Williams. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to give a short round of introduction and then uh, I think we have an exciting uh, set of discussion topics. There are a couple of use cases, which I, you know, I believe is uh, extremely interesting, which we would like to share. And then uh, we have uh, 10 minutes for question and answers as well. So uh, Mark, I'll start first uh, to introduce myself. I'm a dentist by qualification been in the clinical research space for almost 21 years now, work with uh, organizations like Accenture, TCS, IQVM. With an Indigene, I had the global delivery for the enterprise clinical business unit. And, and within our business unit, we are working on several uh, use cases where we are extensively using AI and ML in uh, many of the projects that we're working on. All right, Mark, over to you. Sure, hi, thanks, Santosh. Hi, everybody, my name is Mark Williams. Uh, my background is in engineering and computer science. However, I've worked uh, in the clinical research areas, focusing on data management statistics for a little over 30 years now. Uh, companies I've worked with in the past uh, have been Premier Research, uh, ACI Clinical, which is now part of WCG. Um, my last position before joining Indigene, I was VP of Data Services. Uh, my role at Indigene is primarily in solutioning, looking at technologies for solutions to, to our clients. Thanks, Mark. Okay, I think, I think we can move on. So I'll, I'll give a little preamble uh, about this talk, and then also, then I'll explain, you know, you know, a little bit about the landscape of where AI and machine learning, uh, natural language processing um, has touch points across the landscape of running clinical trials. Uh, you know, first starting with the protocol, as many of you may be aware, maybe some of you are not, there are large initiatives at play trying to digitize the protocol making it go from a document-based protocol to a full digital protocol with structured um, entries that relate directly to study design. Um, one of those initiatives is the Transcelerate DDF initiative, which some of you may be aware of, as well as the CDISC initiative for the USDM or the Unified Study Definitions Model. Those are ongoing and evolving standards although there are practical applications that can be applied today in those areas. And moving to the right, you know, the whole concept of using digital technology, AI, natural language processing, machine learning, is to accelerate the tasks that we who work in the clinical research industry have to perform and the deliverables we have to produce along this pathway all the way to regulatory filings, right? So, Today's talk is primarily going to focus just on clinical data management. While there are applications for AI across this whole landscape, stats and programming, uh, reporting, uh, medical coding. As a matter of fact, medical coding was always an early uh, application where you had algorithms that used fuzzy logic to match verbatim terms to coded terms, whether it be in the WHO dictionary or the MEDRA dictionary. But today we're finding that with the advent of machine learning and natural language processing, there is uh, technologies at play that allow us to interpret a document's content and relate it to something that we would normally do manually. Uh, having worked in data management for many years, although our tools have matured, the time it takes to produce a database from a final protocol has largely not changed in years. Uh, it can take anywhere from eight to 12 weeks, maybe even longer for in many cases. So what we're trying to look at is how does AI, NLP, and ML apply to that specific part 
of what we do in clinical data management. And we have some use cases and a short demonstration to kind of give you a view of what is possible and what is possible now, uh, not necessarily just, you know, hype talk. Um, one of the aspects I want to bring up is when we say AI, there are many different flavors of it. There is big AI, okay, or what we refer to as generative AI, sort of like chat GPT. That's not the kind of AI we're talking about here. We're talking about constrained AI or probabilistic AI, right? Because since we work in a regulated industry, there's a lot of accountability and responsibility for what we do. So using technology that is constrained for a particular task lowers the risk that often is associated with big AI, like hallucinations, right? Um, and then also having the, the concept of introducing a workflow that allows humans to interpret, review, approve what an intelligence is doing. So in this case, I wouldn't even call it artificial intelligence. I would call it automated intelligence. We're automating a task that typically has been very manual, even with the latest tools. And we're producing something that a human has to review, agree, approve in that process to maintain accountability for the technology. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Dr. Santosh, before, before we move on? No, th thanks, Mark. See, I, I think, you know, you and me, we've been in the industry for quite some time now. But if you really see in terms of innovation, pharma has always been one of the last movers, you know, when you compare to other industries. You know, we are always extremely cautious and we don't want to uh, plunge into the latest trends when it comes to technology. And in the last 22 decades, Mark, what I've seen, the biggest innovation has been moving from paper study to EDC. And, and that probably happened around you know, 18, 19 years back. And after that, we really haven't seen any major innovation. But the way things are changing when, it, when we look at AI and ML and how other industries are adopting uh, to this you know, new ways of working, I think uh, it is, you know, things can change very, very quickly. You know, we may not uh, be looking at the next five years, six years, but things can start happening anytime. You know, tomorrow we can probably hear about uh, a new AI tool, which can do a lot of the things which our data managers, programmers are doing. But what is more important is that we need to be uh, prepared that, AI and ML will, will not necessarily take our jobs out, but it will change the way we are working. It will probably make us more smarter and uh, basically help in delivering value to the client, you know, bringing drugs faster to, to the market. That's what I, I think excites me. And today, you know, we have a couple of use cases. I, you know, I, I'm thrilled to uh, showcase some of them to you today, uh, while you know, I go through the tool. Uh, please park your question, you know, for the last ten minutes, uh, or else you know you can use the the chat uh, box and and post your comments or questions there, and we will you know try to answer all of them. All right, so let me stop uh, the screen share and then let me get on to the 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 use cases. All right. Hope you all can see my screen. Huh? All right. Yes. Yeah, we can see it. So the, this is a tool, you know, which we call as clinical study automation tool. It can do a lot of things. Uh, it can create ECRFs from protocol. It can create data management plan documents, several of them uh, in, in real quick time. It can do STTM transformation uh, and many other things. You know, while a lot of these things are work in progress, uh, I can you know, show you how you know, study build activities can be 
if not completely automated, can be automated to say maybe 80 percent. Um, and of course, you know, as Mark mentioned earlier, you need to have a human in the loop approach uh, because our regulatory agencies are also very cautious about use of AI uh, because there can be hallucinations, there can be bias that can come through the AI system. So we need to be very careful in how we really manage uh, each of these tasks that are there. Okay. So for today, what I'll do is I will pick uh, um, a simple protocol. Uh, let me reshare my screen. Uh, hold on. There you go. Okay, so for today's, uh, I, I will pick up a simple protocol, which is uh, the, the indication of the protocol is breast cancer. As you can see, you know, the, the protocol is not really, uh, you know, well formatted. It's it's just a, you know, a lot of dummy data in there, but some of the basic components of the protocol are there in this, you know, one is indication, what are the primary and secondary endpoints that are getting collected? How are the adverse events recorded? We also have a, a, a time and event schedule which talks about when, what form is collected and how many visits are there. Okay, so now that you've seen the protocol, let me bring up the tool. Um, here you go. So, yeah, so the, the first thing that I have to do is I need to add a, a new study. Um, and I give some basic parameters. You know, we will give a study name. In this case, I can give uh, in the gene webinar and a protocol ID. A phase of the trial is important because it can decide the, the total number of CRFs that are required. Uh, this tool is system or EDC agnostic, so it can be incorporated into any of the, the standard EDC systems which are there, uh, like RAVE, Inform, Beaverm, etc. Uh, we choose the therapeutic area. As you know, we are choosing a breast cancer protocol, so I'll pick oncology. Indication is breast cancer. Designer, I'll keep my name. Um, reviewer, I'll keep admin. We can also choose the SDTM version that is being used. So for this demo, I'll pick up the latest SDTM version that is available um, and the terminology. You can choose libraries. Uh, so in, in many of the cases, uh, organizations you know, may have already built a library and you know, they would prefer to use their existing libraries. So I'll pick up oncology, I'll pick up a C dash as well, because sometimes you may not have all the forms in, in your existing library, okay? So now we have created a study. Let's go to the ECRF. Uh, the study name was one, two, three, four, five, six. I need to upload the protocol. Um, and while this is happening, what I would add is the the <clears throat> when you add that particular protocol demonstration that you showed earlier, the the system is going to read the text and start to break it down into concepts. And those concepts, whether it's demographics, what variables are be collected, medications, medical history, and so on, tumor assessments. It is probabilistically matching them to libraries of forms, right? The system doesn't work if you don't have an existing set of form libraries, whether it's in your metadata repository or whether it's specific to a EDC platform. The system here can also load in external libraries so that they don't have to be built from scratch. But that's essentially what it did. And I'll, I'll turn it over to, to uh, Sam Kalash here. Thanks, Mark. So uh, you see, while you know Mark was giving setting some context, 
the, the, the tool has actually created the ECRF now. And while creating the ECRF, it looked into few few things. You know, it used NLP to go through the protocol, read the protocol, understand the text, you know, read the time and even schedule for that matter. So the NLP was able to read all of those things. There is a generative AI component which started working on top of it. And the generative AI looked into the libraries, existing libraries, and then uh, a machine learning component was able to identify and match uh, the, the protocol to the, to the libraries and, and then create the ECRF. Now you can see the ECRF is generated for this specific protocol. It has generated around 34 forms. Um, the NLP component of it was able to you know, identify 34 forms. The machine learning component also was able to identify you know, four components. So let us see how the ECRF for, you know, uh, for each of this form look like. Let me pick up um, something which is complicated. Let's see, you know, let me pick up the non-target lesion follow. -up. Now you can see this is how the CRF will look like. Um, let me first go to the table view. If you log into a Rave platform, your form will, one second. Yeah. will look something like this. You see the, the, the questions, fields, um, the date of scan, all of these fields are already populated. And you can, if you want, you can also see what, you know, what are the, the, the programming that has happened for each of this field and, and the form. And interestingly, you can see that some of the SCTM variables have also been identified. So uh, you, you can see the SCTM variables as well here. So by this method, what we can do is you can generate uh, the, the entire ECRF in, in just a matter of few minutes. Typically, this activity, you know, as per my experience, takes anywhere from a week to you know several weeks. But now, with with the use of AI and ML, we can do it in less than five minutes. Now, what else can this tool do? You know, you can see that it has created a, a time and even schedule as well by reading through the protocol. It has identified what form has to appear in what visit as well. It can do a lot of other things. You know, one of the biggest challenges, you know, or time consuming activities is generation of sev several of the data management plan documents. You know, it can be a unique CRF document. It can be edit uh, check validation specs. Uh, it can also be test cases. Now, all of these things can be, you know, created in, in real quick time. Let, let me pick up you know, a couple of these data management plan documents and see what's the output that we are seeing. Uh, Mark, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Awesome, awesome. So you see the, the title of the protocol that we kept was... Uh, <laughs> Pretty simple title, right? Straightforward, but you can actually see the entire form with the fields, the text that is required, if it is a drop down or you know a, a button option is there, all of this information gets generated in real quick time. Similarly, what we can also see is uh, edit spec uh, validation specs, and I know this activity takes a lot of time unless you have standards available, right? So here is a list of specs. Uh, you know, with the query text, with the edit check rules, uh, item, you know, which form, all of this information is already created. And the same document can be used as your testing document as well. So, you know, when you really start the testing, you can, you know, put your pass or fail uh, descriptions in, in this document. 
it should be obvious to the sophisticated viewer that you have to have standards in place to make this kind of level of automation work like it does. Right. Um, and that that that's the that's the prerequisite for this type of technology. The more standards we apply, and I don't mean just those from CDISC, I mean standards that you reuse typically from project to project, that makes this type of technology for generating a highly, a high quality database specification. A, a specification can be shared for review much sooner than otherwise would be available in a normal process. And in some cases, like in the example that Santosh was using, he chose RAID. You saw in some of the deliverables there, it could create the architect loaded sheet or the ALS document yeah. that can then be directly imported into RAVE and it will build out the database. Now, um, there are other systems you know, that you may be using. Some of them may have specific types of APIs that allow to have a database design be loaded in rather than manually created as we normally do in all these applications. Um, so from that point of view, there, there's, there's some connectivity that has to be taken in consideration, you know, for the particular use case. Um, it also generates test data. So if you know what the boundary conditions for a variable are, or a date range, or, uh, uh, you, you can't have a yes here and a no there, it actually generates test data that allows you to test those boundary conditions for edit check, right? So it does a lot of things that hopefully you've already standardized to some degree within your organization and it's just making it more available. I think one of the things that Santosh and I talk about is we've worked in large data management organizations and in every one of those organizations, you'll have your top data managers, very experienced. They're almost like superheroes when it comes to interpreting a protocol and laying out a database design. But as we know, Sometimes those resources leave the organization and you have loss of knowledge, right? So in many cases, what this type of approach does is it keeps learning and it keeps that knowledge within the organization. It doesn't take away someone's job. The job shifts. You now have to have someone who's really experienced review these outputs because there is a workflow here that has to take in accountability. The system is not perfect. I don't think it ever will be, frankly, because if something new is interested into in, introduced into a protocol, a new type of assessment, a new procedure, a new type of question, you might not have an associated form or variable that it can that it could suggest. So there still will be some editing in any case. It's just that if you can get eighty percent or ninety percent of the design done on a first pass. Ask yourself whether that would really accelerate the activities of getting that database ready uh, for acceptance. It also handles things like protocol amendments. So each time you generate a database design, it can be versioned. And if a human goes in and edits any of that, that's audit trail. So those are some of the some of the activities that um, we would expect to have if you used a algorithm like this um, to be available. Santosh, why don't we go on to the next slide? Because that yeah. kind of actually talks about uh, sure some, some of the things considerations we want to touch on. Yeah, you're right, Mark. I think you know, in terms of the applications of AI ML in in the area of data management, I think the potential is enormous. You know, you 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 can do a lot of things. You know, the, your first slide actually covered. You know, you can create an ECRF. You can build a study. You can do medical coding, you can do SCTM transformation, you can create protocol as well. You know, if you, uh, you know, the tools can actually look into the, the translates DDF, um, you know, apply those standards to whatever, you know, synopsis that you have. And that way, I think, you know, there will be more and more standardization as we, you know, uh, take upon this journey. So, let me bring up some you know considerations uh, that we need to look at while using ai or ml in 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 the work that we do uh, just give me a moment please T 
taking some time today, but there you go. Mark. Great. Yeah. Uh, these are some of the categories that we feel any organization, especially those in human clinical trials, I have to take under consideration when implementing uh, technologies like these. Um, you know, you have to ask, how does this affect um, potentially compliance with regulations? Um, how do we validate or verify? How do we oversee the use of this technology? How are we accountable and responsible for its use? Um, there are ethical considerations, maybe not as much in the application use cases we just showed, but broadly, there are ethical considerations that have to come into play. Um, and what are those risks? You have to do, you have to really consider the risks of using the technology uh, versus its benefits. And the benefits could mean better data quality. It, it basically is using a, a very highly sophisticated algorithm to interpret a study design. So, you know, if I gave the same protocol to three data managers, I might end up with four different data designs, right? So the idea of this is that it can potentially raise data quality, but you still have to have, you know, a significant amount of oversight review and approval process for any use of these technologies. It only works so good as you have standards that the AI can relate to. So if you don't have a lot of data standards like form libraries, or, or if you're not using, excuse me, you know, for the, for this, because standards are constrained. A, a demographic form in a library is all that's there. You won't generate a whole new form out of thin air, at least not today. But in other words, for those forms that exist with existing variables, it brings them all in. And then you have to consider, what about the interoperability? If I use this, how does it interoperate with other downstream applications um, and processes? So anytime you're gonna bring in automation technology that uses aspects of AI or NLP, you have to think about, okay, it does this one thing, how does it impact other things downstream um, from that activity? And the other aspect is, is this something that's scalable and, and what's the maintenance of this long term? Is it sustainable? So those are all considerations that in a generic sense, regardless of the tool, whether it's from uh, a company like Indigene or others, you have to take into consideration how the impact of that technology would be across all these different areas of consideration. You wanna add anything to that, Dr. Satosh? No, Mark, I, I, I think you covered it well. So, you know, one of the, the recent challenges that we've been seeing, not, not related to our industry, but other industries are the hallucinations and the bias that AI can generate. You know, j just to give an example, if, you know, if you ask the same question multiple times to, uh, to, to the AI system now, it keeps changing the responses. And if you start saying that, you know, for a wrong answer, if you keep saying that this answer is fine, the system will start considering that, you know, that's the right answer. And then it will start, you know, giving out fa false results. So that's one of the challenges that we are seeing. And also the, the other one is in terms of the access of data, you know, uh, you know, are these AI tools accessing the entire, you know, worldwide web? or is it restricted to certain validated sources? Uh, you know, as long as it is restricted to validated sources, I think we are okay. But as soon as the, the AI system gets into the, the entire, you know, worldwide web, we, we have major challenges there. So, but I think some of these considerations are very, very critical. Uh, there are guidelines and policies that are being drafted uh, on use of AI on patients, uh, treatment, and, and of course, clinical research as well. Though it's, it's pretty gray at this moment, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, as we start, uh, you know, working on technologies like this, we will get more clarity in terms of how and what's the best way to use AI 
yeah, in, in the kind of work that we do. All right. So uh, I think that that was the last slide from my side, but um, I think we have some time to take on uh, questions. Uh, uh, Jansi, if you can help us with some of the questions. I see a couple here in the chat or the question and answer area. Let me ask the, I'll, I'll read out the first one. Um, challenges and how much workforce is reduced. I would like to know if the tool is not, if the tool is not fed with global ACRF or standard, how trial specific CRFs are treated. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, what we have seen in, in some of the use cases is that the work uh, effort actually gets reduced by almost 80%. And then the time taken to do a task, you know, gets reduced significantly. To, to just give you another example, you know, the, the protocol to EDC go live for last several years that we have known has been anywhere from 12 weeks to 16 weeks, and it has remained the same. But by using this tool, you can actually bring it down to less than three weeks. In fact, 85% of the activities are completed in, in less than five minutes. But then you know, we need to have a human in the loop, you need to validate it. So, uh, and, and then there are obviously other stakeholders will have to review what the work that has been done. Say it can be medical writers, it can be biostatisticians, or the clinical operations team. So therefore, you know, three weeks uh, is the time that it has been able to bring it down. And uh, your other question on whether a global uh, ACRF or ECRF standards are not there and no trial-specific CRFs are there, the tool can look at the C uh, dash uh, standards and uh, it can generate some, you know, some basic CRFs. But if that access is not there, the tool cannot produce anything. Right. So in other words, another question here is, since we see the eCRF are generated automatically, how are you making sure to validate the end results to be correct? What are the different ways to validate what the, I'm, I'm Paraphrasing, what are the different ways to validate what the uh, automation is doing? Yeah, I, I think I, I covered that there has to be a human in the loop. And there is a workflow that is, you know, incorporated in the, into the tool, which ensures that every field, every item, every ECRF that is being generated, there is a sign off that happens from uh, your right. SME, data manager, or the programmer. So that that is mandatory. And we have made sure that you know that those are part of the tool. Yeah, the the system is generating an ECRF specification that can be loaded into a platform, commercial platform. Mm -hmm. However, the workflow process assumes that each ECRF has to be approved. Right. That means a human has to review it. Now, is the system perfect? No. Okay, where would it be likely not to get it right? is a question. And that might be if, for instance, there are entirely new assessments that are in the protocol, that there's no corresponding form or variable to address. So one of the things I would do, just because I've been doing this so long, I know where problems can occur, is I would want to make sure, are there any new types of assessments, both safety and efficacy in the protocol, that don't have a matching correspondence within a library? That would be something. Another area that I would pay a special attention to is the scheduled ass assessments table. While the system can handle pretty straightforward, you know, y-axis, you know, demography, informed consent, medical history, concomitant meds, so on and so on, the domains, which are really types of forms. And then on the x-axis, the visit schedule. Sometimes, and I'm sure you've seen them in some protocols, those that time and event schedule is very complex with footnotes. So in there, I would always wanna make sure you can verify that the machine was accurate. The system allows you to edit it, but you would wanna verify it against you know, the actual protocol. 
one other aspect with which we didn't show, but every time it generates an ECRF and a question, there's traceability to where in the protocol is the text, the actual the sentences or the description of where why that needs to be collected. So it creates traceability from the generation of the ECRF back directly to the protocol text that it's referring to. Um, so there is some traceability on how did the algorithm determine that there needed to be a, a tumor assessment CRF, which shows exactly where in the protocol that's related to. Right. Let's see, we've got a few more questions here. My, I, how is the AI trained to read a pro Yeah, okay, that's a good question. How, did, how was this trained? Well, some of it was done on legacy protocols um, that we and the developers have worked on, as well as CT.gov. So clinicaltrials.gov has a lot of protocols. Yep. Uh, not for the ones typically that are just registered and they're planned, but once they've completed, you have almost the entire protocols text there with some things that are left out. So we've done, you use that as one of the training mechanisms, as well as some of the protocols for our current clients. So there is a training aspect to this. Will it work generically? Yes, but the accuracy goes up Say you're an organization that has a very, very standardized protocol template you use. Say you use the Transcelerate protocol template, or you use what's coming out from ICH, which is the ICH M11 C Sharp initiative, which is a highly structured protocol. The more structure in the protocol, the higher the accuracy. If it's a protocol that looks like it was written on the back of a napkin, you can't expect it to come up with accurate results. Right, right, Mark. There, there, there's another question. What's the level of accuracy or percentage of accuracy you're experiencing using this tool? So when we started, the, the accuracy or confidence level was just around 60%. But now, majority of the, the protocols that we are ingesting, we are able to see close to 90% accuracy. And if there are standards available, we are getting to see almost 100% accuracy. But yeah, even if it is 100%, it still has to go through the validation and approval mechanism that's that's inbuilt. A, a good question, which I would have expected to hear from this audience. If we still have human intervening, intervening post the system has done, after the system has done its job, how do we look on head counts in the team are we also reducing the manpower since most of the work will be automated? My answer to that is, is obviously is, is it's gonna be different for everybody. But my view is we, we are as organizations are constantly being asked to do more with the same or less. So the concept I have here is this technology allows us to do more work uh, with fewer people. That doesn't mean that you, you necessarily have to lay people off or, or shrink your entire data management group. It changes their roles to some degree. They will now be reviewing and editing rather than working always from the start with a clean sheet of paper. So, you know, each company is going to be different. I would say that it, it is a force multiplier, not necessarily a workforce reducer, but I'm sure that will happen. It's inevitable. Yeah, for all Absolutely. of us. So and I, and I think to the degree to the degree that you can become familiar with these technologies going forward, you can remember what happened after we went from paper to EDC. A lot of a lot of clerical staff who were storing, logging, um, reviewing paper CRFs, but those jobs are gone. Yep, yep. But but you know, interestingly, uh, Mark, the workforce did not reduce. In fact, no, it's it, it, it got bigger. It got bigger. So, you know, some of the tasks, you know, which are repetitive, which are simple and easy, may just go away. I'm just talking about the I tasks. Agree, yeah. But the roles will get enhanced. You'll probably be able to do much more than what you're doing earlier. Uh, use the human brain for bringing in more value, right? The machine can only do this much, but. You know, I mean, it, it will reduce repetitive, menial tasks within data management. 
Because right. even a senior data manager knows today, they got to do menial and repetitive tasks. But they're the bigger things are really thinking about, are we collecting what we really need to collect? And we're doing it in the right way. They could focus more on data integrity issues as the trial is running, rather yeah. than all of the little things that have to be done, even before we can collect the first uh, or collect the first data from a patient. So I think it shifts the job rather than removes the job. There's another question which is asking how many years it will take this to happen, Mark. So the, the, the answer is it's, it's already happening. You know, you saw the use cases. Uh, you know, it's already there. A lot of uh, companies have started to use this. Uh, so the, the point we are trying to make is these changes will definitely happen. Um, yeah, I, 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 it, it, it'll vary for different organizations because let's say you're a very high volume um, developer of clinical databases, like a, a very large CRO, a contract research organization, um, versus a, a startup biotech where you're just hoping to get three studies done over the next five years. Um, the use of these tools is obviously where there are very large data management personnel working on dozens, if not hundreds of studies, right? That's where this really will have a maximum impact. If you're working in a very small organization, perhaps your CRO one day will use a technology like this to rapidly build you know, the study database. Um, or if you're a giant pharmaceutical company who's internalized most of your data management, this will have import on that as well. How many years? It really depends on how fast those companies are willing to move to take advantage of, the, of the abilities of these technologies. And that that can take, that can go fast or very slow depending on culture. Right. My, my, Mark, we, we have one more minute. We will try to answer uh, maybe a couple of questions. Uh, there's a question from Suresh. Has AI been implemented for query management or data cleaning? Yes, it, it has been done. Uh, the, the COVID trials were an example on how some of this query management was automated and, and therefore, you know, some of these trials got to close pretty early, right? So it can be done there as well. There's another question which is asking from Nasreen, how many times does the tool require to update as we see many bug fixes and improvised workflows while working in AIM? What is it? Yeah, obviously, you know, when we started, you know, these bugs uh, used to pop up every now and then, but the, the AI tools are also smart, you know, so they keep learning. And, you know, if you really see the use case that I showed, there was no bugs and there was no fix required. Uh, in fact, you know, this can be demonstrated with any protocol, you know, in any format in real time, and you will not really get to see any uh, delays in, in the protocol generation. It may take a minute more, but it will still generate uh, the ECRF. I think, uh, Mark, we are out of time, but I, I think uh, thanks everyone for joining the session. Hope this was- What I, what I would say is we see, we see names of people have asked some questions we were not able to get to, but as a, as a courtesy, we will try to answer you via email because I think some of those questions are good. We just don't have the time to cover them all. Uh, we will try to reach out to you directly from your login email for the questions you asked, try to give you a good response. All right. Thanks, everyone. And Thanks. Uh, have a great holiday, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.